In this presentation, we have the Gabriel Nibiru star that's coming in towards the Earth and has been known to the uh, astronomers since 1841 via a uh, shift in the orbits of the outer planets. Some uh, magnetic force was causing that, and they assumed it was planet X. We find, however, that uh, the position that uh, Gabriel Nibiru is going to take up is identified by the uh, other nine planets. And uh, we see an attempt to uh, remove that from uh, the knowledge of the Earth when uh, the uh, astronomers removed Pluto as being a star, reducing it from uh, eight, from nine to eight. And now we've got Nibiru coming in, we'll bring it back up to nine. But Pluto, of course, is still there, which is 10 in total. So we see why, once we go through the slide, they did that. Blatantly obvious. As said, Nibiru is the angel Gabriel. It was photographed by the infrared imaging satellite on October the 21st, 2003. There are other reports, however, 50 years ago of uh, very clear photographs of the, uh, the uh, iron star coming in. The wings are iron atoms given off by the powerful magnetic field. It is molten iron. The planet is portrayed in an ancient Akanaki mural in Babylon where the ten planets plus the sun and moon, total twelve, are depicted. We see from top left, reading to the right, Neptune, Venus and Pluto. And you'll see the position uh, distances from the sun in the centre, which indicate that uh, Mercury is in its right position, Venus is slightly further out, the Earth and Moon slightly further out. Uh, then we have Nibiru, uh, then Mars, and um, we have Saturn, of course, Jupiter and Uranus, all marked out clearly there. I've uh, overlaid the Nibiru Gabriel in that position there to show that it's the uh, counting from Mercury the fourth out. Here's the actual photograph taken on uh, the 21st of October 2003. In the next slide, the positions of the planet show the 12 spheres and the approaching uh, Gabriel Nibiru and uh, how it will settle in uh, between the uh, Earth and Mars and uh, it has its own planetary system. Seven planets orbiting it are the seven angels of Revelation so when you back engineer the uh, book of Revelation you can see that it is referring to Gabriel who is the angel of God because God has come to the Earth and as God has come to the Earth its angel follows. So the messages are angels and stars. As said, Nibiru is the angel Gabriel. It was photographed by the infrared imaging satellite on October the 21st, 2003. There are other reports, however, 50 years ago of uh, very clear photographs of the, uh, the uh, iron star coming in. The wings are iron atoms given off by the powerful magnetic field. It is molten iron. The planet is portrayed in an ancient Akanaki mural in Babylon where the ten planets plus the sun and moon, total twelve, are depicted. We see from top left, rooting to the right, Neptune, Venus and Pluto. And you'll see the position uh, distances from the Sun in the centre, which indicate that uh, Mercury is in its right position, Venus is slightly further out, the Earth and Moon slightly further out. Uh, then we have Nibiru, uh, then Mars, and um, we have Saturn, of course, Jupiter and Uranus, all marked out clearly there. Now, 
this is the principal reason why NASA built the Space Hubble, uh, which immediately confirmed or rediscovered Planet X. Uh, its space images so detailed, the race was on to build underground bunkers where the elite would go into hiding, leaving the rest of mankind to be burned alive by Nibiru. And I should add that they are also trying to uh, ignite the surface of the Earth with a air bomb by uh, releasing uh, either a nuclear blast or bringing some asteroid in to hit the Earth to set off uh, all the gas fracking that's been done in the United States and Australia, which would uh, totally annihilate the Earth. There's also talk that they're trying to uh, set off a, a nuclear bomb. And of course, when we look at um, the uh, attempt that they made to um, give uh, rockets armed with nuclear warheads to Iran and they refused to take them. The idea was that they wanted to start a war with uh, Israel and the people in Israel, that don't matter at all to the uh, ruling elite. They are not Jews anyhow, they just think they are. And uh, the idea was to um, sacrifice them all anyhow. This is the idea of also of the double cross, the the hands been uh, crossed in the skull and bones tradition and can be seen on the British flags when the ships um, sail back into port, they, they uh, fly the skull and bones. So the, the crossed arms means double cross. You can double cross anybody and anything. So therefore, the Jews who think they are doing it for their God, Lucifer, will be double crossed anyhow, as will those above them, which are the Zionists that um, think that they can escape. Uh, the coming judgment of uh, God by going underground, yet they will be locked underground and burnt alive uh, because Satan wants every human being dead, irregardless of what they believe in and whether they think it is God or not. It wants to get rid of all of the creation of Yahweh. So what the government's failed to um, comprehend fully that creation is all to do with numbers. However, their god Lucifer manipulates men to have their own ideas, while hidden from them, the devil, Lucifer, is a real angel that can not exist on the earth as a being, but only as a spirit. This is uh, evident in the uh, uh, Vedas of uh, the Hindi religion. It tells of a story of how the fallen angels were allowed to come back to the earth after the flood. For prior to the flood, they were able to come as angels and of course they then mated with women and produced this race of giants that had to be destroyed. So the angels were placed on the earth in human form as helps for mankind to educate man to realise Man was created in the image of God, Asherah, Yahweh. They were to bring all races into paradise via the twelve tribes of Israel. They, the youngest race in all of the world, which were Hebrew. The fallen angels in human form mated with the women and produced offspring that were continually evil, taking the earth for themselves. And as I said, the flood was necessary to eliminate the evil. And when we go into the Hindu text, it shows that uh, the raven flew off the ark and landed in Sri Lanka, Colombo. And um, if you go to India today, they will tell you that uh, no man was ever supposed to occupy Colombo, Sri Lanka, because they would become infected by the uh, demons and uh, this is actually what the case is today. We have the uh, the camel, is what they call themselves, uh, that are creating all sorts of havoc throughout India. So with the return of Nibiru Gabriel after an absence of 3,600 plus years, it arrives back and will take up the orbital position fulfilling the prophecy of the Book of Revelation. Being a manifestation of the angel of God, Gabriel, bringing seven angels, which are planets that will restore the earth to paradise. This is the pouring out of the seven vials of the seven angels. Book of Revelation. 
All things are prophecy or prophetic, proven by the numbers of creation. The planets are drawn northward towards the Milky Way galaxy equatorial line at 69,000 kilometres per hour. This causes the planets to orbit and rotate on their axis. Now, Nibiru Gabriel with its seven planets is a molten iron, highly magnetic miniature sun. So it will have to fall into a position where it re will remain influencing the Earth, because this is where creation is, where all life is. And these are related to the planets uh, via their position in uh, an angular degree from the uh, uh, sun itself. So we are trailing behind the sun. Ancient legends tell of flying people who arrived amidst fire and thundering noise. If ancient astronauts did land here, what effect would they have had upon early Earthmen? Perhaps they were worshipped, feared, loved. Perhaps they brought gifts, a new world of knowledge. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. The world is a storehouse, an archive of unexplained phenomena. Gigantic creations, in effigy of what? To appease or acclaim whom? Early stone carvers left silent records for their descendants. Folk legend surrounds their origin. Strange stories of gods who appeared riding across the skies in flaming chariots of light. Whole civilizations were structured around these gods. Civilizations which at one time flourished and then mysteriously disappeared. Only stone relics survive to give mute testimony to their time. Their true history has been the cause of much scientific inquiry and romantic speculation. Teotihuacan lies on a broad, flat plain, curtained by mountains in central Mexico. It was once the center of the highly advanced Aztec Empire. When the Spaniards arrived in the early 16th century, they found an established society of artisans and intellectuals. The name Teotihuacan means where the gods reside. And the city of the gods is dominated by the Pyramid of the Sun. It is 216 feet high and forms a small mountain weighing two and a half million tons. Archaeology seeks answers to questions about man's past by digging through what he has left behind. Here they uncovered a chain of riddles which stretches across the expanse of modern Mexico. A mile to the south is the temple of Quetzalcoatl. Legend tells us that he was a light-skinned, bearded man who came from the stars. Supposedly, he taught men law, the arts, and the cultivation of corn. The head of a great feathered serpent represents the god Quetzalcoatl. When Quetzalcoatl finished his mission on Earth, he departed to his native star, promising to come back someday. It is a pervasive part of mythology that gods fly to the stars with a pledge to return. The strain runs through all folklore. Outstanding astronomers, Mayans calendared the year by constructing a central pyramid with 365 steps. They also developed a formula to predict eclipses without ever knowing about the revolution of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. There is no way of telling how they discovered these secrets. Some ancient astronaut may have told them of the solar system in which they lived. A stone relief portrays a god in a helmet with projections resembling antennae. The Mayans name their patron Kuku Khan. In every 6,000 years, the Mayan calendar is off by only one day. Such was the gift of Kuko Khan. Kuko Khan supposedly came from the stars and returned to them. 
leaving the Mayans to build observatories to search the heavens for him. Perhaps with our modern observatories and telescopes, we are still searching for Kuku Khan and Quetzalcoatl, who deserted to ancient skies. Guarding the headwaters of the Amazon River are the ruins of Machu Picchu, an outpost of Peruvian Inca society. There is a curious folk legend surrounding the origin of this fortress. It is said to have been built by a divine race of light-skinned, auburn-haired descendants of the god Verichochus, who arrived in a flaming chariot. Nothing remains of these supposed people, but the legend goes on to say that they abandoned their citadel and returned to the skies. They left only the ruins of their mountaintop city for us to wonder at. As long as 6,000 years ago, another remarkable civilization evolved. Its people were the Sumerians, who had an extraordinarily advanced culture. Their list of first uh, just almost sounds like a, uh, a whole list of, of our whole society. They had the first bicameral congress, they had the first writing, they had the first school systems, and you know, you just go on and on and on. Um, so you have to ask, uh, well, well, where did all this come from? And I think that you need to turn to the ancient Sumerians themselves and listen very carefully to what they have to say because what they have to say, not just in one place, but over and over and over again, is that they were taught civilization by these uh, beings that came from the heavens to the earth. The Sumerians wrote down their history on clay tablets like these, which lay ignored in a Berlin museum for half a century. This Sumerian cylinder seal from a Berlin museum is astonishing for several reasons. First, it depicts our solar system with the sun at the center and the planets arrayed around it. A fact not known to European science till around 300 years ago. And amazingly, there's another planet, which the Sumerians called Nibiru and believed that it was from where the Anunnaki or celestial giants came from. The surviving historical records of the Sumerians revealed the story of an intruder planet, Nibiru, which appeared out of deep space, returning to Earth's neighborhood once each 3,600 years. In ancient Mesopotamia, the secrets of astronomy and other celestial knowledge are kept carefully guarded, studied behind closed doors by an exclusive society of priest astronomers. Cylinder seals like these are the only surviving record of these carefully guarded secrets. This clay tablet carries the print of a cylinder seal about 4,500 years old. It depicts the god Enlil granting the plow to humankind, ushering in the age of modern agriculture. In our ancient past, there were advanced beings referred to as the Anunnaki, translated, those who from heaven to earth came. The idea that there was in our solar system a race of intelligent beings far older than us who are now gone would certainly force us to rethink lots of questions including the question of human origins where did we come from could we be the products of genetic engineering thanks to the science of archaeology experts now know that the first great civilization emerged almost six thousand years ago the people of this society were called sumerians after their land, Sumer, in the great plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, today's Iraq. The book of Genesis calls the land Shinyar. For generations, biblical scholars either ignore biblical references to ancient kingdoms or categorize these as legend or lore. Through the study of historical relics and the translation of ancient languages, many biblical researchers now believe that the previously questioned Old Testament references are indeed historically authentic accounts of flourishing, advanced cultures. If you study the Genesis document, uh, you know, the, God uh, made Adam out of clay and then took Eve out of his rib, uh, one of his ribs, etc. Uh, if you study this document, you discover that it, it's really a, a much shorter version of a much more complicated document that comes out of Babylonia and, and then out of Sumer and so on. Now, these ancient texts are give a really complicated story of powerful 
uh, non-human godlike beings actually engineering us, making us uh, with, for specific purposes. How would we as a culture respond to incontrovertible evidence of a species of beings that not only preceded our own but actually engineered mankind? Directed panspermia, another scientific theory, suggests that life on Earth is seeded by a race of beings from outside the planet not by chance, but as the deliberate activity of an otherworldly society. The Sumerians pointed the Anunnaki as the creators of mankind, our own benefactors of life. How was Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, fertilization in vitro. But why? Sumerian documentation suggests the Anunnaki create humanity to assist in mining African gold. Now, what, what if it were the case that there were creatures both technologically more advanced than us, older than us in terms of their civilization, and maybe even more intelligent than us, and more spiritually advanced, if we could imagine that, then would this cause the creation story to collapse and, and leaving, you know, literally billions of people on the planet totally confused about the meaning of life. Legend has it that when the Anunnaki came back after several thousand years to see how their genetic handiwork had turned out, they found the Earth females irresistibly attractive. Hey guys, I just wanted to show here on this um, Anunnaki picture. Let's talk about the Anunnaki and their relevance to the uh, pineal gland. And see what's going on with the watchers also. If you see up here on the right of this picture, this is one of the ones you see a lot of times. You see him holding the uh, pine cone, pineal gland here. Now in Zacharias Ditchin's writings, he talks a lot about that they could put on and off their bird helmets, depending on what they wanted to do. So we don't know if this guy, this is his face or it's just a helmet. Okay, we see the pineal gland there. Look, all these all these drawings are built upon one drawing upon the other. If you see here, we can see a face of a different type of an alien. See the big forehead, the eye, and then him reaching right into the back of the head, right where your pineal gland would be, and he's picking that out. You see this? Could be his horn. Now on him it's just a horn of plenty. This is like the horn of plenty. You see his face right in there. Grabbing the pineal gland. Now there's etchings in each one of these things all around here. Even into each one of these little marks here means something upon his body as far as something's going on for him. Now we look over here on the left, we can see the, the beams of light coming down. I believe it's coming down. And if this is a soul descending, this is our soul being created since we're becoming born at that point, coming down to the tree of life. That's where our souls are. Remember Jesus came down and he's created us. Each one, piece of paper. On the other, each one of these feet on each side, you can see the guy's head here. For one thing, let's stop right there for a second. Look at his head. See his face sticking out. See how this little line is right here. See, you can see in the etchings, and it finishes his face. Okay, on the left side here is the sheep. You can see like the sheep-looking foot. And on the right side is the reptile. See the horns? It's the reptile and the sheep. All this is about us being blended together somehow with DNA. What this whole darn thing's about. See that guy up there with his horn and his pineal gland behind him? Now, on this side, I say we had the soul descending to the tree of life. And we've had the pineal gland here. And it's coming down. Let's read my wax paper. As it descends down here into this arm, this is a man's face right here. See his little eye, his mouth. He's laying on his back. There's some old lore about uh, Nimrod saying, hey, don't even go near those Sumerian priests and their knives. He was even scared of them, saying they could take your soul. See the, the knives here? As the soul descends, or as the man descends in there, they're killing it. Okay? They're killing the soul. This is the DNA pouch. In the show of the ancient aliens, they try to say that this is a spacesuit stuff. This is actually DNA coming from the fallen angel through the horn of plenty. 
DNA going into the pouch. Mixing. All of this is mixing together and with the man. It's all of us being mixed together all the way through. And you can see the guy's head. See the little fallen angel's head right here? Let me get you other picture. It's a little bit easier to see when it's like that. See the bulb of his head here? Mixing with this man through these two spouts. You see his face right in there? That's his face. The two mixing together. The fallen angel, the watcher, or whatever, each one. One thing over here you can even see more. You can see demon faces over here, of course. Now over here inside this bucket, after it's all said and done, he has the soul of a man. See the soul of a man inside the bucket? He's ready to take the soul of the man. From here it's descended on down and now he's stolen the soul of man. So he's messed with God's creation like that. He's ended up making it become an abomination. And he's created a messed up, pretty messed up dude. And right here you can see on the uh, Sumerian drawings here the tree of life obviously. And here this man with the phallic symbol. See him interjecting his seed into the tree of life? All of these are DNA strands. These little foils all along here. See how he's putting a pine cone in his head? Right out here he's waiting on the bucket. Now the finished product, after all the DNA transitions and everything ends up, and this is the finished one. It comes out and it pops out right here into this bucket and it's the tree of the, uh, the onk symbol their uh, symbol of life. That's you. That's your soul. After it's all said and done, they basically create your soul into a biscuit so that they can probably eat it or something. Or get, who knows? Just freaking crazy, these darn things. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. And, um, I say the pictures don't lie, so you can look into all those yourself. We see each thing going on here with the squirting out right over here, right into the little bucket. We know they're doing some pretty darn crazy stuff. Okay, thanks a lot everybody, and remember just go look at that stuff, check it all out. Thank you, talk to you later, bye. To the ancient humans on Earth, it resembled a sort of tree, since it consists of an interwoven lattice of electronic field generators and receivers. The electronic field detects the presence of ISBEs, whether the ISBE is occupying a body or if they are outside a body. A portable version of this detection device was carried by each of the members of the domain search party. Stone carvings in Sumeria showed winged beings using pine cone shaped instruments to scan the bodies of human beings. They are also shown carrying the power unit for the scanner, which are depicted as stylized baskets or water buckets being carried by eagle headed winged beings. Members of the aerial unit of the domain search party led by Ahura Mazda, were often called winged gods in human interpretations. Throughout the Persian civilization, there are a great many stone relief carving that depict winged spacecraft that they call a Faravahar. Members of the aquatic unit of the domain search party were called Ons by local humans. Stone carvings of the so-called Ons are shown wearing silver diving suits. They lived in the sea and appeared to the human population to be men dressed to look like fish. Some members of the lost battalion were found in the oceans inhabiting the bodies of dolphins or whales. On land, the domain search party members were referred to as Anunnaki by the Sumerians and Nephilim in the Bible. Of course, their true mission and activities were never disclosed to Homo sapiens. Their activities have been purposely disguised. Therefore, the human stories and legends about the Anunnaki and the other members of the Domain Search Party have not been understood and were badly misinterpreted. In the absence of complete and accurate data, anyone observing a phenomenon will assume or hypothesize explanations in an attempt to make sense of the data. Therefore, although mythology and history may be based on factual events, they are likewise full of misunderstood and misinterpreted evaluations of the data and embellished with assumptions, theories, and hypotheses which are false. The space unit of the Domain Expeditionary Force are shown flying in a winged disk. This is an allusion to the spiritual power of the ISBEs as well as to the spacecraft used by the Domain Search Party. The commander of the Lost Battalion as Cyrus II was an ISBE who was regarded as a messiah on earth by both the Jews and the Muslims. 
in less than 50 years he established a highly ethical and humanitarian philosophy which pervaded all of Western civilization. His territorial conquests, organization of people, and monumental building projects were unprecedented before or since. Such sweeping accomplishments in a short period of time could only have been achieved by a leader and a team of trained officers, pilots, engineers, and crew members of a unit of the domain acting as a team who had been trained and worked together for thousands of years. Although we have discovered the location of many of the Isbees in the Lost Battalion, the Domain has been unable to restore their memory and return them to active duty as yet. Of course, we cannot transport Isbees who are inhabiting biological bodies to the space stations of the Domain since there is no oxygen in our spacecraft. Also, we do not maintain life support facilities for biological entities there. Our only hope has been to locate and rekindle the awareness, memory, and identity of the Isbees of the Lost Battalion. One day they will be capable of rejoining us. 200 BCE, the last remnant of the old empire, pyramid civilization, is at Teotihuacan. The Aztec name means place of the gods, or where the men were transformed into gods. Like the astronomical configuration of the Giza pyramids in Egypt, the entire complex is a precise scale model of the solar system that accurately reflects the orbital distances of the inner planets, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Since the planet Uranus had only been discovered with the modern Earth telescopes in 1787, and Pluto not until 1930, it is apparent that the builders had information from other sources. A common element of the pyramid civilizations around the Earth is the constant use of the image of the snake, dragon, or serpent. This is because the beings who planted these civilizations here want to create an illusion that the gods are reptilian. This is also part of an illusion designed to perpetuate amnesia, the beings who placed false civilizations on Earth are Isbees just like you. Many of the biological bodies inhabited by Isbees in the old empire are very similar in appearance to the bodies on Earth. The gods are not reptiles, although they often behave like snakes. 1034 to 1124 AD. The entire Arab world was enslaved by one man, Hassan ibn al-Sabah. The old man of the mountain. He established the Hashashin who operated apart Mohammedanism, which controlled by terror and fear much of India, Asia Minor, and most of the Mediterranean basin. They became a priesthood that used an extremely effective mind control mechanism and extortion tool that enabled the assassins to control the civilized world for several hundred years. Their method was simple. Young men were kidnapped and knocked unconscious with hashish. They were taken to a garden filled with beautiful black-eyed huris in a harem decorated with rivers of milk and honey. The young men were told that they were in paradise. They were promised they could return and live there forever if they sacrificed themselves as an assassin of whomever they were commanded to kill. The men were knocked out again and shoved out of the world to carry out the assassination mission. Meanwhile, the old man of the mountain sent a messenger to the caliph or whatever wealthy ruler from whom they demanded a payment, demanding camel loads of gold, spices, incense, or other valuables. If payment did not arrive on time, the assassin would be sent to kill the offending party. There was virtually no defense against the unknown assailant, who wanted nothing more than to carry out his mission, be killed, and return to heaven. This is a very crude example of how simple and effective a brainwashing and mind control operation can be when it is used skillfully and forcefully. It is a small-scale demonstration of how the amnesia mind control operation is used against the entire Isby population of Earth by the old empire. 1119 AD, the Knights Templar was established as a Christian military unit after the First Crusade, but quickly transformed into the basis for the international banking system to accumulate money to conduct the agenda of operatives or vestiges of the old empire on Earth. 1135 to 1230 AD, the Domain Expeditionary Force completed the annihilation of the remaining remnants of the old empire space fleet operating in the solar system around Earth. Unfortunately, their long-established thought control operation 
remains largely intact. 1307 A.D., the Knights Templar was disbanded by King Philip IV of France, who was deeply in debt to the order. He pressured Pope Clement V to condemn the order's members, have them arrested, tortured them into giving false confessions, and burned them at the stake in an effort to erase his debt by seizing all of their wealth. The majority of the Templars fled to Switzerland, where they established an international banking system which secretly controls the economy of Earth. Old Empire operatives act as an unseen influence on international bankers. The banks are operated covertly as an uncombatant provocateur to covertly promote and finance weapons and warfare between the nations of Earth. Warfare is an internal mechanism of control over the inmate population. The purpose of the senseless genocide and carnage of wars financed by these international banks is to prevent the ISBEs of Earth from sharing open communication, cooperate together in activities that might enable ISBEs to prosper, become enlightened, and escape their imprisonment. Over our recent years in history, we've had a lot of people come out with things in order to make money on books and things like this that uh, clearly have not done the research, or if they have done the research, they have uh, intentionally misled the public in order to uh, either, one, serve the agenda of some higher power that wants to push whatever it is that they're selling for some reason, or two, uh, they've done it to, uh, you know, because people generally like drama. Uh, they like drama, and there may be some reason why they are pushing these particular issues. The alien uh, issue, which uh, they have turned into being these things called fallen angels, uh, these types of people, or the people that uh, um, over the recent years in history, I guess all the way back and probably until uh, the early um, like 500 or 600 AD or something when when Pope Gregory the Great came out with the word uh, Lucifer meaning something having to do with Satan which it doesn't because it's mentioned sarcastically uh, in regards to a Babylon king which is identified as a man later on in Isaiah and since Lucifer is only mentioned one time in the Bible it cannot mean anything associated to Satan and these types of things have happened over history the things that we're going to talk about today is the name Nephilim and what it really means and where it comes from because now we have people associating Nephilim to reptilians. Reptilians was pretty much promoted by uh, David Icke and people like that and it's turned into this huge thing and now Nephilim means uh, reptilians, it means fallen angels, it means uh, any alien that you see in the sky. You know, you see some of these people that say all aliens are demons and stuff like that. These are the crazies that are out there that don't want to spend any time doing any research at all, but they want to make up these fabulous stories um, because they, you know, they promote drama and people just like drama. So we're going to talk about the word Nephilim today, but before we begin, we're going to take a look at this right here, which is called Strong's Concordance. And it's very important because what it does is it goes into the Bible and tells you what particular words mean. So if you use the King James Bible, for instance, uh, as you go through the Bible, you can actually take a look at the meanings of the particular words that are used because they are derived from Hebrew words. When we take a look in the Old Testament, for example, uh, they are derived from Hebrew words. So here it is. So Strong's Exhaustive Concordance of the Bible, generally known as Strong's Concordance, is a concordance of the King James Bible that was constructed under the direction of Dr. James Strong in 1822 to 1894, and first published in 1890. Dr. Strong was professor of exegetical theology at Drew Theological Seminary at the time. It is an exhaustive cross-reference of every word in the King James Bible back to the word in the original text. Unlike other Bible reference books, the purpose of Strong's Concordance is not to provide content or commentary about the Bible, but to provide an index to the Bible. This allows readers to find words where they appear in the Bible. This index allows the student of the Bible to refine a phrase or passage previously studied. It also lets the reader directly compare how the same word may be used elsewhere in the Bible. 
In this way, Strong's Notes provides an independent check against translations and offers the opportunity for greater and more technically accurate understanding of text. Strong's Concordance includes the Hebrew root words, and this is for the Old Testament. And it's important to understand that the Old Testament does not belong to the Catholic Church. They took over the Old Testament and they put it in their Bible. But the Old Testament belongs to uh, the Hebrew a long time ago. And so when we take a look at the words and the definitions in the Old Testament, it has nothing to do with what the Catholic Church or the modern church believes. It has to do with what they believed when they wrote the Old Testament a long time ago. And these certain words that are used in there are derived from certain Hebrew words. James Strong did not construct Strong's Concordance by himself. It was constructed with the effort of time of more than a hundred colleagues. It has become the most widely used concordance for the King James Bible. So there you go. So when we take a look, for example, in the Bible, we're going to be taking a look at the word Nephilim. For those of you who believe that you should only be reading the King James Bible, well, then you have nothing to worry about because the word Nephilim is never in the King James Bible. In fact, the word Nephilim is substituted for giants. If you take a look here, we see the word Nephilim in the New International Version. And it says in those days and for some time after, giant Nephilites, okay? And then it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days on the English Standard Version. We see in the New American Standard Bible, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And in the King James Bible, we see there were giants in the earth in those days. So the word Nephilim and giants are used interchangeably here. The Nephilim were on the earth in the, both those days, the Nephilim were on the earth, so... In King James Bible, specifically, folks, there is no mention of Nephilim. So then we have to understand, what does the word giants mean in the King James Bible? Now, in order to find the word Nephilim, and I'm using the eSword uh, Bible application here. It's got all of the um, books of the Bible here. And you'll notice here up at the top, I've got Old Testament where it's being searched. We're going to search for Nephilim in the whole Bible here. And we'll find that when doing a search, it's only in two places. Those two places are both in the Old Testament. So let's take a look here at Genesis 6-4. And what you see right here in green are the various definitions for what these things mean, what these various words mean. These are derived from the translations of Hebrew. So when they put giants here in the translation, we can actually see the definition of what they mean from, a, from the Hebrew when it was translated into the Bible. Right here we have a parallel. And we can see the various Bibles that I have loaded here inside eSword. And it says, There were giants in those days and also after that when the sons of God came on to the daughters of men and they bare children with them. But when we take a look at the other ones, for example, when we take a look at the other ones, and in those days and for some, some time after, giant Nephilites lived on earth for whenever the sons of God had intercourse with women so it's not putting the Nephilim in the same context as the people who actually had intercourse with the women it said that it says that they lived on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of man so they're not the, they're not the same as the sons of God otherwise it would say the Nephilim came into the daughters of men and they didn't it's saying it's mentioning two different things in the same sentence. But I digress there. Let's take a look at the definition of what the Nephilim actually is. Now, since it's not listed in the King James Bible, we have to go with what they give us as their interpretation, and that is giants. And when we take a look at H503, or excuse me, H5307, it says from H5307, properly a feller, that is, a bully or a tyrant. So the giants that are being referred to have nothing to do with aliens, reptilians, 
uh, angels or anything of the sort. They're referring to giants meaning tyrants or bullies, kind of like what we're dealing with today, kind of like the uh, the large corporations and things like that. And it may very well be possible that they are trying to misdirect people uh, in some instances so that they can't associate what's happening here to what is actually happening today. If you are a true Christian and you actually read the King James Bible uh, and you are interested in really knowing what's going on, why would you accept anything different than what's actually being shown here in the Bible? If you enjoy the drama, then you're, you're definitely not uh, defining things correctly. Um, and so what good is that for you if you're not going to trust what the Bible is giving you? seems to me is that you're lukewarm what they call Christians in the Bible you believe what you want to believe when you want to believe it the fact is is that the word Nephilim means tyrant or bully and it's clearly marked right here as the word in the definition using the Strong's word concordance so there you go, hate to break the news to you folks, but Nephilim has nothing to do with aliens or fallen angels or anything. Also, there also there is no place in the Bible whatsoever in any of the translations that you will find the word fallen angel. I type in fallen angel here. And we'll just look in King James, for example. We have in Revelation 14.8, and there followed another angel saying, Babylon has fallen. That's the only place in the whole Bible we have fallen angel in the King James Bible. So all these are made up terms. Uh, the fact that Nephilim are aliens or reptilians or alien greys. And by the way, if they were alien greys, alien greys are smaller than the average person, so they can't be giants anyway. So even if you want to objectify it into some kind of materialistic type of thing and try to turn them into something that they're not, it still doesn't make sense because it's not logical. Well, as far as the Book of Enoch goes, there's no place in the Book of Enoch that it mentions Nephilim. It mentions watchers, but that, just like Lucifer, you can't just all of a sudden take that and associate it to something in the Book of Enoch either. So all of this is made up crap, folks. And if you are a real and true Christian, you would follow what's in the Bible and follow the definitions in the Bible and not follow the hype. You guys take care. I'll talk to you soon. prince in the royal palace was the first to take up arms. By words of promise, the other princes he agitated, Alali was his name. Let Lana be the king no more, he shouted. Let decision supplant hesitation. Come, let us unnerve the king in his dwelling, let him the throne abandon. The princes to his words gave heed the gate of the palace they rushed to the throne room its entrance restricted like on rushing waters they went to the tower of the palace the king escaped Alali was him pursuing in the tower there was a struggle Lama fell down to his death Lama is no more Alalu shouted the king is no more with glee he announced to the throne room Lalu rushed, on the throne he himself seated. Without right or counsel, a king he himself pronounced. In the land unity was lost, some by the death of Lama rejoiced, others by Lalu's deed were saddened. Now this is the account of the kingship of Alalu, and of the going to earth. In the land unity was lost, about the kingship many were aggrieved. In the palace, princes were agitated. In the council, counselors were distraught. From father to son, succession from and on the throne continued. Even Lama, the eighth, by adoption a son was proclaimed. Who was Lalu? Was he a legal heir? Was he firstborn? By what right did he usurp? Was he not a king's slayer? Before the seven who judge Alalu were summoned, his fate to consider. 
before the seven who judge, Alalu spread his pleas. Though neither legal heir nor a son firstborn, of royal seed indeed he was. A Van Chagolamite ascended, before the judges he claimed. By a concubine, my ancestor was to him born. Alam was his name. By the Count of Shars, Alam was the firstborn. The throne to him belonged. By conniving, the queen his rights put aside. A law of the seed from naught she created, for her son the kingship obtained. A lawn of kingship she deprived, to her son instead it was granted. By descent, of Alan's generations am I continued, the seed of Van Chagel is within me. The seven who judged to Alalu's words gave heed. To the council of counsellors they passed the matter, truth or falsehood to ascertain. The royal annals from the House of Records were brought forth, with much care they were read. An and and to the first royal couple were, three sons and no daughters to them were born. The firstborn was Anki, he died on the throne, he had no offspring. The middle son in his stead the throne ascended, and it was his name. And Shargal was his firstborn. The throne he ascended. After him on the throne kingship by the firstborn did not continue. The law of succession by the law of the seed was supplanted. A concubine son was the firstborn. By the law of the seed of kingship he was deprived. The kingship instead to Kishagal's son was granted. Her being a half-sister of the king was the reason of the concubine son, the firstborn, the annals made no record. Of him I am descended. Alalu to the counselors cried out. It's Chatty Dad one here coming at you. Well, NASA JPL has uh, given FEMA and DHS a wonderful little tool. And it's all to find victims in an earthquake situation. It's called Finder. And it can detect a human heartbeat. It can differentiate between an animal or a human or something else. This is the little box here. There's a man over here with a control pad. And it'll find you. Okay? There is no hiding anymore from these guys. You can find this guy down in this hole under this concrete. They participated. Oh, and, you know, it's helped from satellites above, too. They participated in the shake-up event. Um, they used it in the, uh, in the tornado situation. You know, and they are going to find you if you have a heartbeat like I say there uh, there was hope with the FLIR camera this, which detects heat there was hope there with the mylar you could protect yourself with mylar and it could not see through it and this I, I don't know what we can do about this here's an article from Homeland Security. Detecting heartbeats in rubble. DHS and NASA team up to save victims of disasters. This is a little tool that they can use for several different things. It'll detect people, not just survivors of earthquakes, but people that they're after too. Anything that's made for good can be used for evil. Remember that. And it will be. Like I say, there is no hiding. If you can't hide in this rubble somewhere and camouflage yourself, there is no camouflage against this technology. Maybe there is. You know, maybe we could possibly 
put some kind of a device on that will mask our heartbeat maybe phase it out or something there's there's got to be something that people can do to protect themselves against this here's some images some more images from uh, Google images for this finder from JPL and uh, you can see radar based technology can locate individuals there's the little there's a better shot of this little pad that they can detect you and and the direction that you are at here's a guy in the military with a little device okay so it's being used for defense industries as well make no mistake this is uh, right here. I don't know if you can read it, but it's, you know, JPL scientists participate in shake that shake out event. JPL NASA investigates. You know, they are checking things out. They can detect you. Like I say, there is no more running from these things. This is the article on the shakeout. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, what a time we live in. I mean, this is great for finding victims of earthquakes and tornadoes and hurricanes. You know, that's excellent that they can help people out and find people and do this but as you see they've already got it in the um, defense in the military usage and you know that they're gonna and they spent billions of dollars with this thing they're gonna use it for defense absolutely so you know <clears throat> I don't know how one could go about tricking this thing if uh, the bad guys get a hold of it and are trying to get you. Say for instance the Russians got a hold of this equipment. It's out there now. They've got to have this technology too or they will soon have it now. Now that these guys have come out and sounded off their trumpet you know that everybody else is going to have it too. So, welcome to the new world. I hope everyone's well and having a good day. <laughs> like I said, there ain't no more hiding anymore in any of this stuff. If you can't hide in that, and this guy's down underneath this in this hole, and they friggin' found him. With that concrete cut out of it. This is the Homeland Security. Um, article about it. Some more pictures from FEMA. See, there's the guy down in that hole. I don't know what the range is on it actually, but uh, it's got a pretty good little range. Oh, that's for another video. Sorry. Anyway, anyway, I hope everyone's well, having a great day. This is Chatty Dad One. Share this video with everybody you know, and uh, God bless and good luck to us all. Never give up your guns unless that's your plan, or your rights will go right along with them. And, uh, like I say, there may not be any hiding anymore from any bad guy. Now, who knows who will get this technology. This is Chatty Dad 1. Over and out. Something I like to, um, cover here. You can see here, uh, 
Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from uh, magic. Now, that same quote was used by uh, the actor in the Thor movie, where he said they, the technology and magic, they can't tell the difference. So, now you got this theory of these reptiles and these uh, shapeshifters and stuff. So, you might have to uh, really begin to consider, is this just a really advanced form of technology? And um, is there anything from the ancient past that can kind of confirm or deny or kind of help us point us in the right direction as to whether or not, you know, these shape-shifting things actually do exist? Now, there's one particular area in the Emerald Tablets of Thoth, which... Some people think Thoth is Satan, and some people think he's not, um, whatever. But what I'm just going to take it from here is the, uh, the eighth tablet. I'm going to read a little bit here for you. And then I'm going to show you some videos here uh, to, to see if we made a link. So it goes on here in the eighth tablet. Speak I of ancient Atlantis, speak of the days of the kingdom of shadows, speak of the coming of the children of shadows. Out of the great deep were they called by the wisdom of earth men, called for the purpose of gaining great power. Far in the past, before Atlantis ex existed, men there were who delved into darkness, using dark magic, calling up beings from the great deep below us. Further came they into this cycle, formless were they, of another vibration, existing unseen by the children of earth men. Only through blood could they have formed being, only through man could they live in the world. In ages past were, the, were they conquered by masters, driven below to the place whence they came. But some there were who remained, hidden in spaces and plains unknown to men. Live they in Atlantis as shadows, but at times they appeared among men. Aye, when the blood was offered, for they came, they to dwell among men. In the form of man they amongst men, but only to sight were they as are men. Serpent-headed when the glamour was lifted, but appearing to man as men among men. Crept they into the councils, taking forms that were like unto men slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms, taking their form and ruling over man. Only by magic could they be discovered, only by sound could their faces be seen. Sought they from the kingdom of shadows to destroy man and rule in his place. Now if you go back there and you say only by magic could they be discovered, how about only by advanced technology could they be discovered? Could they be seen with technology. Serpent headed and serpents got tongues. And it also says slaying by their arts the chiefs of the kingdoms. Now take a look at the picture here. Last year John Kerry showed up. Look at his face. This is uh January twenty fourth, twenty twelve. Okay? He's beaten, there's some bubble on his eye. And they're trying to say he was playing a friendly hockey game. This six foot eight dude who probably doesn't even know how to hold a hockey stick. Okay? And look at him. He's bloody and battered and beaten. Or was he slain and taken over? Because if you look at the carry nowadays, he doesn't seem to have much any many wrinkles on his face, so I don't know if it's collagen or what. But we're just going along this theory. Now take a look at this uh, girl here. This is by the Pope, uh, Ratzinger, during his internet, uh, praise the internet speech. Now look at her tongue. You see how it goes up and underneath? See right here? Underneath the lip? See how big that sucker is? Okay. Now we're going to go over here. And take a look at uh, the Senate confirmation hearings, which was like January 2013. Look at uh, look at Carrie here. Look at his tongue. Now, if you notice that tongue, that tongue goes. It's and sometimes it's a tongue that actually does pop out. Other times, is this is a thing that shoots out underneath his lip. And it's 
it's so fast I gotta slow it down here I'll put all the original clips that you guys can watch down here but in this he's talking about uh, his new world order and all this other stuff the new world order in my opinion if this the reptilian theory is correct are these uh, ancient beings from the kingdom of shadows that have come and taken over men that um, they've taken over their bodies and they are now ruling uh, in the kingdoms of men just as it was say, stated in the Bible when the devil told Christ to bow before him because he and, and said you can have any kingdom you want because he rules all of them the serpent rules them all because they've taken over these cowards who have sold their souls <laughs> so wherever the real John Kerry may or may not be I don't know but this theory seems pretty logical and it it almost seems as though these people are bent on the destruction of mankind uh... they cloak themselves behind all types of different um, fads and rages and um, movements right now they're cloaking themselves behind uh... the civil rights movement the gay movement so they're hiding behind the gays and the blacks then the, and the jews they like to hide behind the jews they always have a victim mentality uh, and they lie their ass off and when they confront it with a lie they get angry very fast they won't have a logical uh, conversation with anybody because it's not it doesn't process in their reptilian brain they're savages and that's who runs this country in my book in this theory now to further prove this point a little more John Kerry uh, donned his uh, beaten battered face um, at the White House um, during the Boston Bruins uh, Stanley Cup uh, ceremony. Now, I did a video a while back about the Boston Bruins logo. So if you look at it right here, it's got the symbol in the back um, and then the B. The B is a 13. There's a 1 and a 3 there in that B. Lowercase b can also be can look like a 6 and a 9. So, now, the symbol in the back here is quite interesting because uh, it could be a satanic symbol because it's used uh, very often. Um, and you could see it here at the St. Peter's Basilica. Now, uh, Basilica is very close to the word basilisk, which is a serpent monster. So, now, it's up to you to decide whether or not it's possible that the uh, all the rulers of the world and all the rulers of all the religions are compromised and uh, this whole entire world is um, being hijacked by uh, ancient entities um, that dwell in the shadows and come from another realm or vibration.
Yeah, I gave this worm too much acid. <laughs> Yo, how high are you right now? In our solar system, a race of intelligent beings far older than us who are now gone would certainly force us to rethink lots of questions, including the question of human origins. Where did we come from? Could we be the products of genetic engineering? Thanks to the science of archaeology, experts now know that the first great civilization emerged almost 6,000 years ago. The people of this society were called Sumerians, after their land, Sumer, in the great plain between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers, today's Iraq. The book of Genesis calls the land Shiniar. For generations, biblical scholars either ignore biblical references to ancient kingdoms or categorize these as legend or lore. Through the study of historical relics and the translation of ancient languages, Many biblical researchers now believe that the previously questioned Old Testament references are indeed historically authentic accounts of flourishing, advanced cultures. If you study the Genesis document, uh, you know, the, God uh, made Adam out of clay and then took Eve out of his rib, uh, one of his ribs, etc. Uh, if you study this document, you discover that it, it's really a, a much shorter version of a much more complicated document that comes out of Babylonia and, and, and then out of Sumer and so on. Now, these ancient texts are give a really complicated story of powerful, uh, non-human, godlike beings actually engineering us, making us uh, with, for specific purposes. How would we as a culture respond to incontrovertible evidence of a species of beings that not only preceded our own but actually engineered mankind? Directed panspermia, another scientific theory, suggests that life on Earth is seeded by a race of beings from outside the planet, not by chance, but as the deliberate activity of an otherworldly society. The Sumerians pointed the Anunnaki as the creators of mankind, our own benefactors of life. How was Adam created? According to the Sumerians, it was by genetic engineering, fertilization in vitro. But why? Sumerian documentation suggests the Anunnaki create humanity to assist in mining African gold. Now, what if it were the case that there were creatures both technologically more advanced than us, older than us in terms of their civilization, and maybe even more intelligent than us, and more spiritually advanced, if we could imagine that, then would this cause the creation story to collapse and, and leaving, you know, literally billions of people on the planet totally confused about the meaning of life? Legend has it that when the Anunnaki came back after several thousand years, to see how their genetic handiwork had turned out, they found the Earth females irresistibly attractive. Hey guys, I just wanted to show here on this um, Anunnaki picture. I'm going to talk about the Anunnaki and their relevance to the uh, pineal gland and see what's going on with the watchers also. If you see up here on the right of this picture, this is one of the ones you see a lot of times. You see him holding the uh, pine cone, pineal gland here. Now in Zacharias Ditchin's writings, he talks a lot about that they could put on and off their bird helmets, depending on what they wanted to do. So we don't know if this guy, this is his face or it's just a helmet. Okay, we see the pineal gland there. Look, all these, all these drawings are built upon one drawing upon the other. If you see here, we can see a face of a different type of an alien. See the big forehead, the eye, and then him reaching right into the back of the head, right where your pineal gland would be, and he's picking that out. You see this? Could be his horn. Now on him, it's just a horn of plenty. This is like the horn of plenty. You see his face right in there. Grabbing the pineal gland. Now there's etchings in each one of these things all around here. Even into each one of these little marks here means something upon his body as far as something's going on for him. Now we look over here on the left, you can see the, the beams of light coming down. I believe it's coming down. And if this is a soul descending, this is our soul being created. 
since we're becoming born at that point, coming down to the tree of life. That's where our souls are. Remember, Jesus came down and has created us. Now, each one, on the other paper, on the other, each one of these feet on each side, you can see the guy's head here, for one thing. Let's stop right there for a second. Look at his head. See his face sticking out. See how this little line is right here? See, you can see any etchings. And it finishes his face. Okay, on the left side here is the sheep. You can see like the sheep looking foot. And on the right side is the reptile. See the horns? It's the reptile and the sheep. All this is about us being blended together somehow with DNA. What this whole darn thing's about. See that guy up there with his horn and his pineal gland behind him? Now, on this side, let's say we had the soul descending to the tree of life. And we've had the pineal gland here. And it's coming down. Let me show you my wax paper. As it descends down here into this arm, this is a man's face right here. See his little eye? his mouth. He's laying on his back. There's some old lore about uh, Nimrod saying, hey, don't start a war with uh, Israel. And the people in Israel, that don't matter at all to the uh, ruling elite. They are not Jews anyhow. They just think they are. And uh, the idea was to um, sacrifice them all anyhow. This is the idea of also of the double cross. The, the hands been uh, crossed in the skull and bones tradition and can be seen on the British flags when the ships um, sail back into port they, they uh, fly the skull and bones so the, the crossed arms means double cross you can double cross anybody and anything so therefore the Jews who think they are doing it for their god Lucifer will be double crossed anyhow as will those above them which are the Zionists that um, think that they can escape uh, the coming judgment of uh, God by going underground, yet they will be locked underground and burnt alive uh, because Satan wants every human being dead, irregardless of what they believe in and whether they think it is God or not. It wants to get rid of all of the creation of Yahweh. So what the government's failed to um, comprehend fully, that creation is all to do with numbers. However, their god Lucifer manipulates men to have their own ideas while hidden from them the devil, Lucifer, is a real angel that can not exist on the earth as a being but only as a spirit. This is uh, evident in the uh, uh, Vedas of uh, the Hindi religion. It tells of a story of how the fallen angels were allowed to come back to the earth after the flood for prior to the flood, they were able to come as angels and, of course, they then mated with women and produced this race of giants that had to be destroyed. So the angels were placed on the earth in human form as helps for mankind to educate man to realize man was created in the image of God, Asherah, Yahweh. They were to bring all races into paradise via the 12 tribes of Israel. They, the youngest race in all of the world, which were Hebrew. The fallen angels in human form mated with the women and produced offspring that were continually evil, taking the earth for themselves. And as I said, the flood was necessary to eliminate the evil. And when we go into the Hindu text, it shows that uh, the raven flew off the ark and landed in Sri Lanka, Colombo. And um, if you go to India today, they will tell you that uh, no man was ever supposed to occupy Colombo, Sri Lanka, because they would become infected by the uh, demons. And uh, this is actually what the case is today. We have the... Uh, the camel is what they call themselves uh, that are creating all sorts of havoc throughout India. So with the return of Nibiru Gabriel after an absence of 3600 plus years, it arrives back and will take up the orbital position fulfilling the prophecy of the book of Revelation. 
being a manifestation of the angel of God, Gabriel, bringing seven angels, which are planets that will restore the earth to paradise. This is the pouring out of the seven vials of the seven angels. Book of Revelation. All things are prophecy or prophetic, proven by the numbers of creation. The planets are drawn northward towards the Milky Way galaxy equatorial line at 69,000 kilometres per hour. This causes the planets to orbit and rotate on their axis. Now, Nibiru Gabriel with its seven planets is a molten iron, highly magnetic miniature sun. So it will have to fall into a position where it re will remain influencing the earth because this is where creation is where all life is and these are related to the planets uh, via their position in uh, an angular degree from the uh, uh, sun itself so we are trailing behind the sun ancient legends tell of flying people who arrived amidst fire and thundering noise if ancient astronauts did land here, what effect would they have had upon early Earthmen? Perhaps they were worshipped, feared, loved. Perhaps they brought gifts, a new world of knowledge. If we accept the premise that beings from another civilization visited here ages ago, then some of the mysteries of our past take on a new and startling light. The world is a storehouse an archive of unexplained phenomena. Gigantic creations, in effigy of what? To appease or acclaim whom? Early stone carvers left silent records for their descendants. Folk legend surrounds their origin. Strange stories of gods who appeared riding across the skies in flaming chariots of light. Whole civilizations were structured around these gods. Civilizations which at one time flourished and then mysteriously disappeared. Only stone relics survive to give mute testimony to their time. Their true history has been the cause of much scientific inquiry and romantic... You can go near those Sumerian priests and their knives. He was even scared of them, saying they could take your soul. See the, the knives here? As the soul descends or as the man descends in there, they're killing it. Okay? They're killing the soul. This is the DNA pouch. In the show of the ancient aliens, they try to say that this is his spacesuit stuff. This is actually DNA coming from the fallen angel through the horn of plenty. DNA going into the pouch. Mixing. All of this is mixing together and with the man. It's all of us being mixed together all the way through. And you can see the guy's head. See the little fallen angel's head right here? Let me get you other picture. It's a little bit easier to see when it's like that. See the bulbous head here? Mixing with this man through these two spouts. You see his face right in there? That's his face. The two mixing together. The fallen angel, the watcher, whatever, each one. One thing over here you can even see more. You can see demon faces over here, of course. Now over here inside this bucket, after it's all said and done, he has the soul of a man. See the soul of a man inside the bucket? He's ready to take the soul of the man. From here, it's descended on down, and now he's stolen the soul of man. So he's messed with God's creation like that. He's ended up making it become an abomination. And he's created and messed up pretty messed up dude. And right here, you can see on the uh, Sumerian drawings here, the tree of life, obviously. And here, this man with the phallic symbol. See him interjecting his seed into the tree of life? All of these are DNA strands. These little foils all along here. See so how he's putting a pine cone in his head? Right out here he's waiting on the bucket. Now the finished product, after all the DNA transitions and everything ends up, and this is the finished one. Comes out and pops out right here into this bucket and it's the tree of the, uh, the onk symbol. Their uh, symbol of life. That's you. That's your soul. After it's all said and done, they basically create your soul into a biscuit so that they can probably eat it or something. Or get, who knows? Just freaking crazy, these darn things. Okay, uh, thanks a lot. And um, I say the pictures don't lie, so you can look into all those yourself. We see each thing going on here with the squirting out right over here. 
right into the little bucket. I know they're doing some pretty darn crazy stuff. Okay, thanks a lot, everybody. And remember, just go look at that stuff. Check it all out. Thank you. Talk to you later. Bye. To the ancient humans on Earth, it resembled a sort of tree since it consists of an interwoven lattice of electronic field generators and receivers. The electronic field detects the presence of ISBEs, whether the ISBE is occupying a body or if they are outside a body. A portable version of this detection device was carried by each of the members of the domain search party. Stone carvings in Sumeria showed winged beings using pine cone shaped instruments to scan the bodies of human beings. They are also shown carrying the power unit for the scanner, which are depicted as stylized baskets or water buckets being carried by eagle-headed winged beings. Members of the aerial unit of the domain search party, led by Ahura Mazda, were often called winged gods in human interpretations. Throughout the Persian civilization, there are a great many stone relief carving that depict winged spacecraft that they call a Farah Vahar. Members of the aquatic unit of the domain search party were called Ons by local humans. Stone carvings of the so-called Ons are shown wearing silver diving suits. They lived in the sea and appeared to the human population to be men dressed to look like fish. Some members of the lost battalion were found in the oceans inhabiting the bodies of dolphins or whales. On land, the domain search party members were referred to as Anunnaki by the Sumerians and Nephilim in the Bible. Of course, their true mission and activities were never disclosed to Homo sapiens. Their activities have been purposely disguised. Therefore, the human stories and legends about the Anunnaki and the other members of the domain search party have not been understood and were badly misinterpreted. In the absence of complete and accurate data, anyone observing a phenomenon will assume or hypothesize explanations in an attempt to make sense of the data. Therefore, although mythology and history may be based on factual events, they are likewise full of misunderstood and misinterpreted evaluations of the data and embellished with assumptions, theories, and hypotheses which are false. The space unit of the Domain Expeditionary Force are shown flying in a winged disc. This is an allusion to the spiritual power of the ISBEs as well as to the spacecraft used by the domain search party. The commander of the lost battalion as Cyrus II was an ISBE who was regarded as a messiah on earth by both the Jews and the Muslims. In less than 50 years he established a highly ethical and humanitarian philosophy which pervaded all of Western civilization. His territorial conquests, organization of people, and monumental building projects were unprecedented before or since. Such sweeping accomplishments in a short period of time could only have been achieved by a leader and a team of trained officers, pilots, engineers, and crew members of a unit of the domain acting as a team who had been trained and worked together for thousands of years. Although we have discovered the location of many of the ISBEs in the Lost Battalion, the domain has been unable to... In this presentation, we have the Gabriel Nibiru star that's coming in towards the Earth and has been known to the uh, astronomers since 1841 via a uh, shift in the orbits of the outer planets. Some uh, magnetic force was causing that and they assumed it was planet X. We find, however, that uh, the position that uh, Gabriel Nibiru is going to take up is identified by the uh, other nine planets, and uh, we see an attempt to uh, remove that from uh, the knowledge of the Earth when uh, the uh, astronomers removed Pluto as being a star, reducing it from uh, eight, from nine to eight, and now we've got Nibiru coming in. We'll bring him back up to nine, but Pluto, of course, is still there, which is ten in total. So we see why, once we go through the slide, they did that. Blatantly obvious. As said, Nibiru is the angel Gabriel. It was photographed 
by the Infrared Imaging Satellite on October 21, 2003. There are other reports, however, 50 years ago, of uh, very clear photographs of the, uh, the uh, iron star coming in. The wings are iron atoms given off by the powerful magnetic field. It is molten iron. The planet is portrayed in an ancient Akanaki mural in Babylon where the ten planets plus the sun and moon, total twelve, are depicted. We see from top left reading to the right Neptune, Venus and Pluto and you'll see the position uh, distances from the sun in the centre which indicate that uh, Mercury is in its right position, Venus is slightly further out, the Earth and Moon slightly further out. Uh, then we have Nibiru, uh, then Mars, and um, we have Saturn, of course, Jupiter and Uranus, all marked out clearly there. I've uh, overlaid the Nibiru Gabriel in that position there to show that it's the uh, counting from Mercury, the fourth out. Here's the actual photograph taken on uh, the 21st of October 2003. In the next slide, the positions of the planet show the 12 spheres and the approaching uh, Gabriel Nibiru and uh, how it will settle in uh, between the uh, Earth and Mars. And uh, it has its own planetary system. Seven planets orbiting it are the seven angels of Revelation. So when you back engineer the uh, book of Revelation, you can see that it is referring to Gabriel, who is the angel of God, because God has come to the earth. And as God has come to the earth, its angel follows. So the messages are angels and stars. As said, Nibiru is the angel Gabriel. It was photographed by the infrared imaging satellite on October the 21st, 2003. There are other reports, however, 50 years ago, of uh, very clear photographs of the, uh, the uh, iron star coming in. The wings are iron atoms given off by the powerful magnetic field. It is molten iron. The planet is portrayed in an ancient Akanaki mural in Babylon where the ten planets plus the sun and moon, total twelve, are depicted. We see from top left reading to the right Neptune, Venus and Pluto and you'll see the position uh, distances from the sun in the centre, which indicate that uh, Mercury is in its right position, Venus is slightly further out, the Earth and Moon slightly further out. Uh, then we have Nibiru, uh, then Mars, and um, we have Saturn, of course, Jupiter and Uranus, all marked out clearly there. Now, this is the principal reason why NASA built the Space Hubble, uh, which immediately confirmed or rediscovered Planet X. Uh, its space images so detailed, the race was on to build underground bunkers where the elite would go into hiding, leaving the rest of mankind to be burned alive by Nibiru. And I should add that they are also trying to... Uh, ignite the surface of the Earth with a air bomb by uh, releasing uh, either a nuclear blast or bringing some asteroid in to hit the Earth to set off uh, all the gas fracking that's been done in the United States and Australia, which would uh, totally annihilate the Earth. There's also talk that they're trying to uh, set off a, a nuclear bomb. And of course, when we look at um, the uh, attempt that they made to... Um, give uh, rockets armed with nuclear warheads to Iran and they refused to take them. The idea was that they wanted speculation. Teotihuacan lies on a broad flat plain curtained by mountains in central Mexico. 
It was once the center of the highly advanced Aztec Empire. When the Spaniards arrived in the early 16th century, they found an established society of artisans and intellectuals. The name Teotihuacan means where the gods reside. And the city of the gods is dominated by the Pyramid of the Sun. It is 216 feet high and forms a small mountain weighing two and a half million tons. Archaeology seeks answers to questions about man's past by digging through what he has left behind. Here they uncovered a chain of riddles which stretches across the expanse of modern Mexico. A mile to the south is the temple of Quetzalcoatl. Legend tells us that he was a light-skinned, bearded man who came from the stars. Supposedly, he taught men law, the arts, and the cultivation of corn. The head of a great feathered serpent represents the god Quetzalcoatl. When Quetzalcoatl finished his mission on Earth, he departed to his native star, promising to come back someday. It is a pervasive part of mythology that gods fly to the stars with a pledge to return. The strain runs through all folklore. Outstanding astronomers, Mayans calendared the year by constructing a central pyramid with 365 steps. They also developed a formula to predict eclipses without ever knowing about the revolution of the Earth, Moon, and Sun. There is no way of telling how they discovered these secrets. Some ancient astronaut may have told them of the solar system in which they lived. A stone relief portrays a god in a helmet with projections resembling antennae. The Mayans name their patron Kuku Khan. In every 6,000 years, the Mayan calendar is off by only one day. Such was the gift of Kuku Khan. Kuku Khan supposedly came from the stars and returned to them, leaving the Mayans to build observatories to search the heavens for him. Perhaps with our modern observatories and telescopes, we are still searching for Kuku Khan and Quetzalcoatl, who deserted to ancient skies. Guarding the headwaters of the Amazon River are the ruins of Machu Picchu, an outpost of Peruvian Inca society. There is a curious folk legend surrounding the origin of this fortress. It is said to have been built by a divine race of light-skinned, auburn-haired descendants of the god Verichochus, who arrived in a flaming chariot. Nothing remains of these supposed people, but the legend goes on to say that they abandoned their citadel and returned to the skies. They left only the ruins of their mountaintop city for us to wonder at. As long as 6,000 years ago, another remarkable civilization evolved. Its people were the Sumerians, who had an extraordinarily advanced culture. Their list of first uh, just almost sounds like a, uh, a whole list of, of our whole society. They had the first bicameral congress, they had the first writing, they had the first school systems, and you know, you just go on and on and on. Um, so you have to ask, uh, well, well, where did all this come from? And I think that you need to turn to the ancient Sumerians themselves and listen very carefully to what they have to say because what they have to say, not just in one place, but over and over and over again, is that they were taught civilization by these uh, beings that came from the heavens to the earth. The Sumerians wrote down their history on clay tablets like these, which lay ignored in a Berlin museum for half a century. This Sumerian cylinder seal from a Berlin museum is astonishing for several reasons. First, it depicts our solar system with the sun at the center and the planets arrayed around it, a fact not known to European science till around 300 years ago. And amazingly, there's another planet, which the Sumerians called Nibiru and believed that it was from where the Anunnaki or celestial giants came from. 
The surviving historical records of the Sumerians reveal the story of an intruder planet, Nibiru, which appeared out of deep space, returning to Earth's neighborhood once each 3,600 years. In ancient Mesopotamia, the secrets of astronomy and other celestial knowledge are kept carefully guarded, studied behind closed doors by an exclusive society of priest astronomers. Cylinder seals like these are the only surviving record of these carefully guarded secrets. This clay tablet carries the print of a cylinder seal about 4,500 years old. It depicts the god Enlil granting the plow to humankind, ushering in the age of modern agriculture. In our ancient past, there were advanced beings referred to as the Anunnaki, translated, those who from heaven to earth came. The idea that there was 